All right, so the next section is how do we get here? Um, history of voting technology, hanging chads, and the Help America Vote Act. Um, Matt Blaze, a cryptog cryptographer and associate professor of computing and information science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we'll take it from here. Hey, so welcome. Uh, congratulations on lasting this long um, in the day. Um, so I'm going to step back a little bit. So a little bit about me. I'm a, a computer scientist. Uh, I focus on computer security and cryptography stuff. And I've been working um, partly on voting technology and other kinds of uh, related systems uh, probably for about a dozen um, years now. And one of the things that uh, I've been very lucky enough to do is participate in several of the state top to bottom reviews of voting technology that were done ahead of the 2008 election, where um, a few people um, were given access to the source code and the hardware and so on of the, most of the uh, electronic voting systems discovered in the country. And we were asked, uh, you know, our task was to basically say, are these things secure? And the first question you, ask, uh, you should ask when given that task is, well, what secure me? What, what are the requirements of this system that we're trying to measure against it? And so for a voting system, one question at a very high level is, what are the requirements for a voting system? That is, how do you tell if a voting system is serving democracy, whatever that means? And as far as I can tell, the requirements for a democracy's voting system is f these four words, right? One person, one vote. Where do these four words come from? These are in the Constitution, right? Or the Declaration of Independence or something? No, who knows? It's a slogan, right? Um, so uh, one person, one vote. What does that actually mean? And, and that's a good question. So first of all, voting for what, right? Most of, most of our voting is for officials rather than uh, issues, um, although in California you are asked to make about 6,000 decisions about uh, uh, various initiatives. That's kind of an exception. Mostly we're asking other people to make our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, governmental decisions for us, and that's who we're voting for, but even those officials are appointing other people. Um, so we have a kind of representative democracy or a republic or something along those lines that isn't precisely one person, one vote on every single thing government does. So it's already kind of fuzzy right there. The second is that, uh, you know, now we can look a little bit, well, what does person mean? And I think what that means is that the influence of your vote is supposed to be based on whether or not you're a person and you get if you are, your personhood entitles you to as many votes as other people's personhoods um, do, and not some other qualification. So it's not money or land ownership or noble birth, even though in early U.S. democracy, uh, we certainly uh, cared a lot about those things. Uh, but once you figured out who is a person, um, Every person is supposed to have the same influence and eligibility. And by the way, we have the Electoral College in this country, which um, um, also um, uh, 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 affects that. So um, we're already kind of qualifying this a lot, and we're only kind of halfway through. This has evolved over time in the United States. Um, you know, it, you, the expression used to be one man, one vote. Um, and, you know, it took until the 20th century before um, we... Uh, um, realized that uh, we were a kind of a priori excluding half of uh, voters uh, in, in the United States. Um, uh, you know, we, we had this concept of, uh, of uh, slavery and automatically disenfranchised citizens uh, who didn't get to vote uh, for the longest time until the 14th Amendment. Um, and uh, we used to have, in many places, um, tests for eligibility to vote, literacy tests and so on. So again, personhood has, has had asterisks next to it throughout this uh, history. And it also involves more than merely your eligibility to vote, but your access to voting, as well as some assurance that, you're vo that you don't merely get to vote, but you get a vote that counts. And so um, 
we, we want some concept of fairness in the elections. Well, what does fairness in the election mean? Well, you, we can come up with some requirements. And as soon as you, you're a technologist, it becomes really easy to add new requirements to this. Um, as soon as you start um, uh, listing them, uh, you, know, you're, you're, you, you can't even write them down as quickly as you can think of, of them. So we want things like equal access to the ballot, uh, to be able to run for office, to being on the voter rolls, to being able to cast ballots. So you don't want people to be disadvantaged in any of those things. Um, in the United States, almost all adult citizens are eligible to vote. Is voting optional or is it mandatory? That's a question. In the United States, it's optional. Um, there are other countries where voting that we would consider voting, uh, that we would consider democracies where voting is mandatory, Australia, for example. Um, we want the accuracy of the count to be something that's assured. We want, we want people to be confident that all votes were counted and that this has been fair. We want there no, to be no cheating. We don't want it to be possible to cast more than one vote. We don't want to prevent other votes from being counted. We don't want people to be able to intim be intimidated out of voting. And that implies a requirement for secrecy. No one can find out how you voted um, so that they could either reward you or punish you uh, depending on how your uh, vote happened. We don't want there to be transferability. You don't want to be able to transfer your ability to vote to another person. In the last talk, we heard about somebody who uh, lets, has their lawyer vote for them um, um, for, for some reason. Um, and um, you know, that's not supposed to be allowed in our system. Um, <clears throat> and then we have, ultimately, public confidence in the outcome. We want not only this to be true, but we want people to believe that it's been true. Now, if you are a computer scientist, um, one of the things you do is you look at the requirements and you say, well, the best thing I can possibly do when given a set of requirements is show that there's no point in even trying to build a system that meets them because it's theoretically impossible. And this is the sort of set of requirements that lends itself to that very quickly because we can kind of see that some of these requirements kind of contradict each other that you might have to choose between one or the other or make some kind of compromises um, uh, uh, down the line um, among them. Um, so the one that I want to focus on is secrecy versus transparency. We want everybody to be confident in the outcome. We want everybody to be confident that their particular vote um, is uh, counted, but we don't want to be able to prove how any individual voted or allow somebody else to be able to find out how it was. Uh, that's pretty hard. Um, and it uh, leads to lots of uh, um, uh, difficulty in designing very heavily constrained systems. One of the things we hear over and over again is, well, hey, we have secure ATM machines. Why can't we have secure DRE voting machines? Well, in an ATM machine, you kind of get a receipt of how much money you withdrew. Um, and uh, we really don't want, because of one of the requirements, to give people a receipt showing how they voted. And so on and so on. So this is kind of difficult. So the best slogan I can come up with is, one adult citizen, one easily exercised but non-transferable option to cast a secret accurately counted vote after a fairly conducted public campaign that will determine their representative for certain <laughs> issues. Um, and that, that's kind of the mod, that's kind of the computer scientist version of one person, um, one vote. Okay, so there's technology involved here. Um, we have been increasingly using technology to conduct elections, although that has not been true uh, since the beginning. Early elections in the US, as I think a number of speakers in this track have, have pointed out, basically consisted of a bunch of rich dudes um, uh, showing up in a room and raising their hands uh, on election day. And everybody could kind of agree on what the outcome was from that. But that has the problem that it's not secret. Um, so we didn't have ballot secrecy from the very beginning in the United States. Um, and it probably doesn't scale very well. Um, asking people to all show up in the same room and raise their hand uh, and, and count uh, is uh, you know, uh, probably not something that could scale up to kind of modern population densities. So what that means is not just the principles have become important, but the mechanisms with which we implement these principles have become 
um, really important. Um, and so technologies for voting have evolved over time to uh, increasingly allow, uh, to take advantage of new advances in technology, to allow voting to scale up, and to try to bolster one uh, or uh, another of the kind of informally stated requirements that elections have. So we have paper ballots, uh, mark something and put it into a box. We have machine counted ballots, um, mark something in some way and drop it into a box so that it can then be counted and tabulated by some sort of uh, machinery. Um, we have um, direct recording voting machines interact with a machine that mechanically will mark a ballot that is then stored inside the machine itself. Uh, those were the machines I grew up on. Um, New York State had them. Um, these machines with these levers, you would uh, flick the little levers. What they would really do is mark a little advancing piece of paper for each uh, poll. When you pull this big lever, a chunk happens. That's the sound of democracy in action. The curtain opens, and then you can leave the, uh, um, the room. Those machines were in use um, since the late 1930s uh, through uh, around uh, 2000, uh, throughout much of the country. Another um, uh, type of uh, um, machine is replacing that but with modern computer technology. So instead of um, a lever, you touch a screen. And instead of marking on a piece of paper, you store it on a memory card. And because the voting community is great at catchy names, those are called direct recording electronic voting machines. Um, they're direct recording because they record directly inside the machine. They're electronic because they're computers. Um, I prefer to call them, as many people in, in, in the uh, electronic voting community, prefer to remind us that that means they're voting computers. Um, and that means that understanding what they do is as easy or hard as understanding what any general purpose computing device does. Um, and whether or not it actually works faithfully is as hard or as easy as building bug-free software. Um, now, Perception and reality are, re are linked here. Public confidence in elections is what gives government legitimacy. And now public confidence in elections is not just a matter of whether or not we trust the vote, but whether or not we trust all of the technology that led to the ultimate tabulation of the vote. So in other words, computer science and building reliable computing systems as we use computers for this um, is actually kind of central to whether or not we regard the government we have as legitimately being allowed to govern. Uh, in other words, you should be in this room thinking about this. You should be engaged in this issue, as you all are. And you should scold people who aren't here for not showing up, right? Um, okay, so what's the threat model is the first question a computer science security type would ask. And the traditional threat model for an election is what? It's the traditional thing that we have to defend an election against. What? Well, so we want to defend, what would you be trying to do? What would an attacker be trying to do? Fraudulently vote. We want to stop people from casting more than one vote per person. Uh, we want to stop people from being able to sell or buy votes. We want to prevent ballot stuffing to prevent somebody from getting elected to dog catcher without actually the will of the people um, being, uh, uh, being behind that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. But the threat is ultimately in the service of cheating on the election. That's kind of the traditional threat model that we all are trying to think of. And I'm sure you have a lot to say, but I get to talk. Um, the, um, the, uh, the traditional threat model is cheating, right? Trying to alter the outcome to serve you. Because either you think you get to vote more times than you should, or because you're the candidate and you really want this office instead of that other jerk. And in fact, there's a long history of uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of fraud 
in um, uh, U.S. elections. We've had, uh, you know, people being um, sent into polling stations to vote by candidates and vote buying and ballot stuffing and a number of ingenious ways, many of which have interacted in remarkably quick ways with a new voting technology, where somebody has figured out how to exploit um, a flaw in some new voting technology that, that has come out. And so almost all of the laws and procedures and so on have been um, looking at this threat model. And one question you have to ask about any new technology is whether it can become easily unplugged and stop the video from going through. Um, and um, let's see. And that'll show up in a second. So the thing that you have to ask about any new technology is compared with the technology that preceded it, does this make that threat easier or harder? Right? Does, the, does the next technology uh, uh, that comes along um, uh, make us better off or worse off against this threat? And the electronic voting community, uh, at the time that I've worked in it, has largely you know, asked the question, are DRE machines better against uh, this sort of traditional threat than, uh, than the uh, paper systems or, or what have you that they had before? There's also another threat, and this is a threat that we haven't, we've kind of understood, but we haven't understood it at, in quite the sharp way that we understand it now um, until uh, the most recent national election, and that's uh, the threat of hostile state actors. That is, um, someone who's not necessarily interested in stealing a local office, but rather interested in um, doing that or perhaps other things, perhaps disrupting the vote itself uh, to create disorder or casting doubt on the legitimacy of the winner to govern um, in the, uh, as a hostile state action, as an act of, um, of state aggression. And this is a very different class of threat. Um, this is a, a, a class of threat in which, first of all, the attacker is trying to do, is, may be satisfied with many more different kinds of outcomes than someone trying to steal a specific office who's focused on one thing, and is also an attacker who's likely to have vastly greater resources both to understand the tech under underlying technology as well as to carry out the attack. And so a question we also have to ask is, does whatever our, the technology we're using um, make this uh, threat uh, an easier threat or a, a, a tougher threat? And that's a question we haven't really been sharply asking for, uh, for very long. Okay, voting in the US, everybody knows voting in the US is highly decentralized. Um, federal government only sets kind of broad standards. Each state has its own laws, but elections are run at the local level, mostly run by counties. There are over 3,000 counties in the United States. And then in places where you vote in person, election takes place in neighborhood voting precincts, um, which might serve um, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of voters within that precinct, and there might be tens, hundreds, or thousands of those precincts per county itself. U.S. elections are more complex than almost anywhere in the world. We make more decisions. We have more races. And within precincts, there may be multiple different kinds of ballots because you might be voting not just for president, but also for, like, who represents you on the school board. And that might be different from other people voting in the same precinct. So we have really complicated elections, and that very much means that computers have a natural role in simplifying the tabulation process. It's, you know, it's not nefarious that people have thought of the idea of using computers for this, uh, because it's a pretty natural um, uh, consequence of just how complex and, and, and large scale um, US elections actually are. Uh, does anyone recognize this photo? <laughs> Um, and, uh, so this is, uh, um, uh, what, what, what was this photo of? Yeah. Hanging Chad. So that man was named Chad? Or, uh, no, so this was, uh, this was one of the Florida recount judges um, in, an, in a remarkably fortunate capture the moment pose, um, <laughs> looking at a ballot and examining it from the 2000 Florida election. Um, a question for you. and, and 
people have different answers to this question. How many people look at this picture and say, what an embarrassment that technology is? Versus how many of you look at that picture and say, what a great thing that technology was? How many think, what an embarrassment that technology is? In this room, not, not that many, okay? How many people think what a great thing that technology was? Yeah, I, I'm probably in that category too. Why? Uh, those are the only two in this room. That is not, yeah, you can rant at me after the talk. Okay, um, the, okay, so, <clears throat> so I happen to have one here. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, an example of one of these machines. Uh, because I'm just clumsy. Okay, so this is um, an example of one of these machines. And I have a photo of it, which I will put up. But while that's going, I can just show you what the photo is of. Uh, this is a, a, a punch card voting machine. Um, and this is the type used in Florida. This particular one was um, from uh, Wisconsin. And it has the ballot in it from uh, the ballot card in it from the uh, 2000 election. And um, it's a really interesting technology because the first thing you will notice about this technology is there, is no elect there are no electronics involved in this um, at all. Um, the, um, this is 1960s technology. Um, these, uh, these started to be produced in the 1960s. They were used through about 2000 and then something mysteriously happened to make people not like them. Um, <laughs> And uh, the voting experience does not involve any electronics at the polling place. Um, there are electronics involved in the tabulating. And what do you do? Well, how do you vote? Well, what you do is you take a ballot, which will are given by your poll worker. And this is usually in, contained in a booth. The booth does have electricity involved. Um, you, um, uh, it's for the light above the thing that illuminates it. Um, and that's about it. Um, we take your ballot and you insert it into the machine and you push it down a little bit. There's a little spring that makes sure you, li make sure you line it up properly on these two little um, red uh, uh, knobs. And um, now you can flip through your voting instructions. And when you want to vote, you pick your candidate. I'm going to vote down the straight Wisconsin Greens um, ticket. I have no idea what they stand for. I presume it has to do with moldy cheese. <laughs> and I'm going to vote for them. And now I voted. What have I done? Well, I pull my ballot out. And you will notice, you can see a little hole in there um, that I have made. It's punched out. These are uh, perforated um, a little uh, uh, rectangles associated with each possible position here. Um, and so if you voted, for somebody, one of those little holes would get uh, punched out. And you can, if you're a suspicious type, you might imagine that, um, hey, wait a minute, how do I know I actually marked the correct position? Well, you would notice that, well, my candidate was number 68, and oh, look, it's box number 68 that's been punched out. And now you take your, your ballot, you rip it apart, you put it in the ballot box or wherever it goes, and they take a stack of these and they put them through a typical like IBM style punch card, hollereth card reader, and it shines a little light through each card one at a time and produces a, uh, produces a result. So all of the technology, all of the computer type technology and the electronics are on the back end of the system. The voting itself is actually a pretty low tech process. So there's an interesting property of these machines that um, is really quite um, remarkable, which is that in spite of the fact that there are no computers involved at the polling place, there is, and I can't decide whether to call it a memory leak or a buffer overflow uh, attack in the vote casting process. And anyone who was alive during late 2000 learned all about this uh, technology. What would happen? Well, at the beginning of the day, you put your card in, and you punch holes in it. Um, and the holes get punched in pretty easily. Now, I want us to move from Wisconsin, where people are very hardy, to Florida, where people are old and have arthritis. Um, and imagine that you are kind of old and arthritic. 
you're being asked to perform a little bit of a physical feat um, in voting. You have to take this little stylus, line it up, and punch through the cards. But it's actually fairly easy to do. Um, you know, it, there, there's a little perforation in here. It's actually fairly easy to, um, uh, to punch through the card. But what happens is, because of conservation of matter, um, the little pieces of paper that you are punching out go somewhere. And where do they go? Well, this is the machine. Well, there's a little kind of piece of rubber with little slits in it behind each of the, uh, uh, behind each of the holes uh, in this. And they are, you're basically kind of just stuffing the pieces of paper um, into this little piece of rubber, and it's about that thick. Um, so it's, you know, you're just kind of pushing this into this rubber uh, um, uh, slit uh, thing. It gives a little, tiny little bit of resistance. As the day goes on, the really popular candidate accumulates more of these little bits of paper called Chad behind their little hole where you would vote for them. And in a typical election where you know maybe 100 people show up in a polling place, that's fine. There isn't enough to make a difference. But if there's a really big turnout, like say Bush versus Gore, Right, where people really cared about the outcome and they knew it was going to be close. Lots of people show up at the polling place. So these machines are designed to serve maybe 150 people across the course of the day before you have to open up the machine and kind of vacuum it out. But um, in the 2000 election, it was a pretty popular race. And so what happened is that the really popular candidate in any precinct got physically harder to vote for as the day went on. And we have a population of people, many of whom aren't all that physically strong to begin with, right? This is, this is where your grandparents go to retire. Um, and so um, the, the people showing up late in the day, if they wanted, if they were in a precinct where Bush was really popular, it was hard to vote for Bush. <coughs> if Gore was really popular, it was hard to vote for Gore. And um, in Miami-Dade County, that happened a lot. So a normal ballot kind of looks through it like this. You have a, a really strong hole. If we look at a ballot when this has happened, <clears throat> we might have for the less popular office a really straightforward hole in it. But for the more popular candidates, they might not succeed in pushing that through all the way. They might only kind of dimple it down a little bit, but not um, uh, push it through completely. So what would happen there? Well, anybody who examines it with their eyes would say someone was clearly trying to vote for somebody there. Um, you can kind of clearly um, do that. Um, but um, if you run it through an optical scan um, reader that's just pushing, throwing light through this, that's going to be opaque, and it's going to look as if they didn't vote for anybody. Um, and that's called a dimpled chad, a term that did not exist prior to the 2000 election. Um, <clears throat> another possibility is that they'll push it through, but not enough to actually dislodge the piece of paper from the ballot and create like a little flap. And that is called a hanging chad. Um, so these terms go from kind of cute sounding dimpled chad to a little bit dirty sounding, hanging chad, uh, as, the, uh, um, as you look at the two possible failures. Um, now, if, if you think about you know, using something and having it get harder uh, as the um, uh, day goes on, because, you know, for example, you haven't garbage collected the um, result, that just looks like a, buffer, you know, like a, uh, um, a memory leak problem in computer science. And they managed to implement a technology with a memory leak without malloc involved at all. It's really, uh, really, um, um, really quite impressive. So what did we have to do? Well, that's what led us to this um, uh, unfortunate photo. Now, the consequence of this unfortunate photo was that this at the time, the caption of this photo was along the lines of, what a bunch of idiots in Florida, Lo using this antiquated technology. This can't ever happen again. We are America, the most technologically advanced country on earth. We can't have this in the 21st century be the way we run 
our elections. This can't ever happen again. Um, and we had something absolutely remarkable uh, happen after that. Republicans and Democrats have not agreed on whether the sky is blue in a long time, but one thing they absolutely agreed on, this is bad. Congress passed something called the Help America Vote Act with enormous bipartisan support. It was hurriedly passed after the 2000 election. And um, what did it do? Well, it provided a giant pile of money um, for the states to shift to accessible voting technology. That is, voting technology that would be easy for the disabled to use, that could be adaptive, and so on. Um, now, mostly, that technology at the time Help America Vote Act was passed did not exist on the market, right? You couldn't just buy them. There were some machines that, that met this requirement, but not really very many. What it effectively mandated was the rapid development and deployment of computerized voting technology um, that was adaptable enough to be useful for the disabled, and that basically means touchscreen voting machines in most, in most cases. Why touchscreen voting machines? Well, it can be adapted to multiple languages very easily. You can you know, select which language you want to vote in um, very easily. It ha can have a little audio interface so that if you're um, um, blind, you can get uh, instructions. For the profoundly uh, mobility impaired, there are things like sip and puff interfaces that can um, 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 be used to navigate the screens. It's actually genuinely better for people who are visually impaired, mobility impaired, uh, and so on than almost any manual technology, but it largely kind of didn't exist on any kind of large scale at the time uh, the Help America Vote Act um, passed. Now, uh, it also provided uh, substantial funding for states to buy this by a certain deadline. Um, and so what would you imagine if you were an entrepreneur around that time? Um, you know, this looks like a pretty great business opportunity to meet this newly created demand that the federal government uh, has uh, uh, provided money for, for all, all of the various states. And, you know, the market succeeded at meeting um, uh, uh, demand for this. Unfortunately, security requirements weren't really meaningfully represented in the standards that were mandated by Help America Vote Act. Um, um, basically, they had to have some relatively minimal uh, checklist of um, uh, reliability uh, testing. Uh, it was kind of left to the states to say what those particular standards were. And um, ultimately, um, uh, a few vendors emerged to have these products that were, were sold to the states, and this money has been uh, essentially spent uh, at this point. Um, so we saw this very rapid shift to touchscreen computerized voting um, since, the, uh, since that election. Okay, now let's, I'm just, this has been covered a lot earlier uh, uh, today in other talks and, and you know, we have examples of this out in the uh, hacking village, but I just wanna um, talk a little bit about what the technologies are. The most common after Help America Vote Act was the direct recording electronic voting machine um, that's the voting computer that stores its results internally, typically uses a touch screen um, with an adaptable interface for voting. Uh, there are other types of um, technologies that were permitted under Help America Vote Act. One is precinct counted optical scan, um, which basically is a uh, you know, optical scan like uh, exams, standardized tests back in the 1990s, um, fill it in with a number two pencil, um, and then pe uh, put it through something that looks like either a fax machine or a shredder, um, and uh, um, reads your ballot and tabulates it internally, and then stores the paper ballot. How is that an accessible technology? Well, you can build ballot printer devices, ballot marking devices that use the touchscreen interface for the visually impaired and for the mobility um, uh, impaired. Um, the country was roughly split, and in some states they used both of these technologies. And then for absentee ballots, they generally use um, optical scan, um, centrally counted uh, when you mail your ballot in. Um, but in all cases, computers are very heavily involved, not just for the tabulation, but at the polling place itself. 
So you, this essentially mandated pushing computer voting technology out into the field. Um, you know, hundreds of uh, these specialized devices out at every of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of polling places in the U.S. Um, okay, now the security here now depends, we've now added the software and hardware of all of these voting computers um, to the security of the election. Um, the correctness of the software depends a lot, um, is, is, de is depended on for the integrity of the election. And of course, compromise of software might be subtle, and we don't know what we're doing when it comes to producing large-scale software that actually works, hence Patch Tuesday, which is actually every day of the week now. Um, and, you know, these are no exception. In fact, many of these machines are running under the hood the same platforms that you get um, um, uh, urgent security updates for uh, every, every day. So we have no general technique to determine whether software is correct. We have no general technique to d even determine how a program behaves under all circumstances. And by the way, we can even prove that we don't know this. Um, uh, you know, the, this is one of the very few things um, software correctness knows, which is that general purpose hardware is impossible to say anything reliable about. <clears throat> Complexity kind of makes building correct systems harder, and these systems are very, very complex. Um, it's easy to hide malicious behavior, and um, it's easy to even hide uh, the audit that the um, system uh, 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 maintains. Okay, so people have been um, worried about this for a while, and the question of whether these machines are secure is one that <coughs> has been the focus of, excuse me, many <coughs> uh, computer scientists and election integrity advocates since <coughs> these machines got introduced um, about 15 years ago on a large scale. But we've had a focus very heavily on the voting machines themselves. And I think one of the um, most important things to keep in mind is that the voting machines themselves are kind of the shiny, attractive target. Um, these, uh, these are electronic voting machines. We, they might be able to be easily compromised. Um, and uh, we worry a lot about their... Um, um, whether or not they have been hacked or have malicious backdoors. And that, a, a lot of our focus has looked at these. I've been fortunate enough to participate in a number of studies of these systems in which we discovered horrific vulnerabilities where we were literally limited by our typing speed in writing them down. Um, and th pretty much everybody has had the same experience, who's looked at these has had kind of the same experience. Like you, you open them out of the box and they hit you in the face with some of their, uh, with their vulnerabilities. But in fact, in um, 2016, we saw um, what was probably the first um, in the United States large scale attempt to disrupt an election. And interestingly, it appears not to have involved voting machines themselves at all. Um, it involved instead the back-end voting systems used by voting uh, officials to register voters, to tally ballots, to create the ballot definitions, and to manage the day-to-day -day election operations. Um, why, um, given that these machines are so vulnerable, would an attacker um, uh, not use that as an attack vector, but instead would do what looks to be pretty garden variety fishing and Trojan horse attacks uh, against election officials to get to their back ends. Why would they do that? Well, the reason is, as easy as it is to attack a voting system, it's even easier to just mail your malware to a voting official wrapped inside an ostensible doc file uh, and have them open it and install it on the back end system themselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, narrowly focusing on the voting machines as the only part of this voting technology is um, um, probably missing a large fraction of the attack surface um, of these machines generally. 
Um, so I'm not going to go through the, um, uh, all of the different things that we've discovered with the um, uh, uh, existing technology, except to say that four major vendors of voting systems emerged after the Help America Vote Act. Um, one is called ESNS, um, and uh, another is called what's called Diebold. Diebold got some bad press um, very early on about the security of its voting technology, and so they fixed that by changing their name to Premier, um, <laughs> and um, uh, then uh, selling the, b being bought by ESNS. So the four became three, and then there is Heart InterCivic and Sequoia. Um, each of these vendors produces both DRE and optical scan systems, uh, as well as the back-end provisioning and tallying um, software that runs on the network within a county. Um, and between ESS, ESNS and Premier, which are now ultimately owned by the same place, that serves kind of 80% of the uh, voting market uh, in the United States. <clears throat> so there have been many questions raised about the security of these systems, um, partly because the software and the firmware running them on them is closely held as a trade secret. Um, and so they, they're not open to public inspection. You have to, um, states had to put a lot of pressure on the vendors to allow independent reviews to happen. Now, fortunately, in the most recent round of um, exemptions to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, the Librarian of Congress granted a very broad exemption to the primary law against reverse engineering these systems and uh, um, uh, without permission. Um, uh, a general exemption for good faith security testing and specifically called out voting technology as being one of the important areas that this exemption would apply to. So something that would have been very, very difficult to do legally has now been um, largely um, blessed as being an important public good if it's done in good faith for the purpose of improving security. So one of the things that I would encourage everybody to do this weekend is spend some time use, applying your talents in the hacking room, learn how these machines work, and go wild on them. Um, take them apart because we have a kind of rare opportunity to uh, open up the community of uh, talent uh, looking at these machines orders of magnitude broader than it's been um, open um, uh, ever before and we, you know we're going to learn new things about it but I will point out the exemption only applies to you if it's done in good faith if you're trying to steal an election does not apply to you so <laughs> please tell us about and publish your results and I think I have a little bit more time for questions thanks So, yeah. What exactly was the butterfly ballot? Uh, okay, so if you, the butterfly ballot is uh, the question. So uh, on ballots with a lot of different races, this unfortunately is not a butterfly ballot, but it could be. Um, what they would generally do is have every other hole on opposite sides of the page. So the uh, even numbers would be on this side and the odd numbers would be on this side. And so one would be, you know, Nader would be here, and then Bush would be here, and then Gore would be here, and so on. And so you'd have to keep looking across the uh, page to see where your hole was. That's really confusing from a usability point of view. And the Florida ballot in Dade uh, County for the presidential race uh, was a butterfly ballot. It's called butterfly because it uses kind of both sides of the paper, and you can, if you use your imagination, and pretend this is a butterfly. Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, we could look. We could formal verification has a role here, um, you know, absolutely. But it's really important not to to look at formal verification and, and see it as a panacea, because first of all, we don't really know how to build systems at the scale of the entire closed loop of an election system. Um, in a formally verified way in practice. Um, and secondly, it essentially precludes using any off-the-shelf software 
for anything at any, in any part of the system. And then, of course, if any aspect of the system changes out from under you, like the platform because new hardware becomes available, that may break all of the things that you're formally verified for. So, you know, the, uh, this is absolutely has an important role in improving reliability, but it's, it's by no means, you know, we, we don't get to, get to say formal verification and declare victory. Um, you know, I think Revest's idea of software independence is really important here. What we should try to do is aim to make little or nothing in the system depend on the correctness of software. So for example, a, a ballot marked by the voter um, that might be tabulated by computer, but that artifact stays behind, has the property that even if the tabulation software is bad, if you get enough of a clue that it might be bad, you can go back and uh, count the paper. And that's a really, really important uh, property. I've been ignoring this side, sorry. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I would look at what happened after Help America Vote Act as, you know, capitalism worked, the market, you know, built what the market demanded. And, you know, what uh, voting officials wanted was to be able to buy new voting machines according to whatever their state's requirements were. And different states have, have 50, there are 50 different sets of, of um, requirements, all slightly different. In some states, there, it requires a paper artifact. So some states would have a, um, a paper, um, something called a VVPAT, Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail, which is a little piece of paper that would print out what your selection is. And if you were, if you were a conscientious voter, you could look at that and see that oh, the touchscreen um, uh, thing that I touched is actually being printed. And in the event of a recount, the paper would be, um, would be what's counted. Even that, they would get wrong sometimes. In the machines that we looked at um, for one state, um, the way the VVPAT worked was it, it would print that out, but it would also then print a barcode with what your vote was. And in the event of a recount, what they would count was the barcodes. Um, and so, you know, unless you have a barcode reader with you in the voting booth, you have no way of actually um, verifying that. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This must baffle you terribly at how stupid we're being. Uh, we, we recently had an election where we bought wallpapers to fill out mm -hmm. because uh, electronic voting basically removed our voting rights. Mm -hmm. Right. So the underlying question here is why do we automate these votes? Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, I mean, it, I can't speak to the entirety of U.S. politics, um, uh, but, you know, the short answer is we could automate a lot less than we do, um, but, you know, the scale of U.S. elections is um, like no other in any, um, uh, any other country in the world. We just vote on more issues. We have more different kinds of ballots. Uh, you know, the pressure to automate components of U.S. elections is higher than probably anywhere else in the world. But, you know, I'm obviously sympathetic to the point of view that, that you know, we, the first requirement is that we should have high confidence in the outcome. So you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, compared to what followed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this, this is a terribly difficult problem, right? One, one consequence of federalism is we push this down to the state level. The states generally push the purchasing decisions down to the local level. Um, you know, so that mostly means counties in the U.S. Essentially, it means that the election um, budget is competing with building fire stations and roads and uh, you know, sewers that don't clog up and other things people want. You know, if you're a county official, you know, do you want to 
go to your um, constituents and say, hey, I got us great new voting machines, or you know, I paved that road with all the damn potholes on it. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, that's what the political reality is in most of the US. I, so I think the competition for where the weak link is, is fierce. Uh, the, the competition for where the weak link is here is fierce. It's fierce. Yes, very, a uh, lot of weak links. Yeah. The, the, the notion that there is so much diversity within the machines and mm -hmm. within the different precincts and different, different technologies used mm -hmm. within the sort of uh, the voting process for right. the general election, uh, can you speak to that? So, one of the, you know, an argument that's made, and this argument is, uh, is a double-edged sword, uh, is that we have m high diversity here in both the um, uh, operational places that are running elections as well as the technologies that are used, right? We have 3,000 counties in the U.S., which means 3,000 different um, uh, offices, all a little bit different. Uh, running, you know, machines from four vendors of which there are multiple versions of them. And, you know, one thing you could, a kind of trite conclusion you could reach is that it would be really hard to cover all of this if an attacker wanted to completely alter the U.S. election. But unfortunately, what this means is that, first of all, an attacker doesn't necessarily have to cover all of them. They have to cover enough of them to achieve their outcome. Uh, and their outcome might simply be casting doubt on the ultimate result. Um, uh, casting doubt on the legitimacy of whoever is elected. Um, it's sufficient to do that to show that at least one of them has been compromised and leave the question about whether the others are compromised. So that diversity doesn't necessarily um, buy us everything we need. The second is as a cryptographer, um, you know, we have this kind of strong idea, you know, when somebody says, well, what block cipher should I be using? We just say, use AES, and then they say, but, wait a minute, if AES is broken, um, you know, what if AES is broken? That would just be terrible and it would have a horribly disruptive uh, uh, effect on everything. But the nice thing about this is now we've had one system that's been scrutinized so heavily that you know, if you discover a flaw in AES, you get to be cryptographer of the century. Um, and it's a heavily rewarded thing that, you know, the enorm enormous intellectual effort has gone into um, understanding what, this, what the properties are. If there were 3,000 different versions of it, no one of them would have the level of scrutiny that the really heavily uh, looked for one was. So uh, that, that's kind of the counterpoint to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for like two more questions if you're quick. So one of the best things that happened to concerns about this um, was when, you know, once somebody from, from both parties has lost an election, it stops being a partisan issue. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll remember that, um, you know, that we've had, uh, you know, both Democrat and Republican losers of elections since these machines have uh, been introduced, and that will help turn this into a less fiercely partisan issue. But my ability to predict the future is un sadly limited um, on how this will go. Uh, hopefully, I, you know, but I can be hopeful and optimistic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So, 
so I'm not personally familiar. I mean, they're using some quantum communication channels. As a cryptographer, this quantum thing is terribly confusing because we have quantum computers and quantum communication, and they're totally different things, and one affects cryptanalysis and the other affects communication. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, there are certainly ways to use technologies that are better than the way we're using them, but I think our issues, we have to look at the kind of architectural issues first before we can, if we're gonna start from scratch, uh, I think we have to look at the architectural issues first. So you had, you had your uh, hand up. I think you get the last word. I mean, certainly having multiple multiple vendors and so on is is absolutely a you know reasonable thing to be thinking about. But when I talk when I think about architectural issues, I think about questions of things like software independence and really fundamental questions of what the model is. And I think those those will rec um, deserve quite a bit of attention as we move forward on this. So thanks very much, everyone, and we have a we have a great panel coming up.